Thank you, uh, Takeshi. And good morning again, uh, everyone, and welcome to the second panel. Uh, we are a little running a little behind time, so I'm just going to turn it immediately to our first speaker, uh, Mila Cacho, the regional director for UN Women, a good partner of UNOEC. Um, so over to you, Mila. Maybe you can open with your uh, your statement, and then we'll move to questions. Good morning, everybody, and, and it's a great honor to be with you here today. Um, and first, to really say, as echoing a lot of the speakers who spoke earlier today, I think it's a fantastic uh, forum that you're providing uh, us, and I very much thank uh, Thailand Institute of Justice, our partner in various uh, research and, and, and activities relating not just to Thailand, but also for, which is relevant for rest of Asia, Pacific, and also to the world. Also, of course, our friends at UNODC, uh, who has been very active in, in bringing in the gender element to this, and I very much appreciate your kind invitation to have us uh, represented here. Um, I was really listening with great interest what was discussed earlier, uh, also as a reflection of the three-day visit. Uh, what I heard from some of, I think, the, the fellows of, of the TIJ um, Rule of Law and Development uh, fellows, uh, were very insightful, and also it comes to the heart of what we're discussing in UN system as, as large, but also in UN women as well. Because we tend to look at the issue, such as criminal justice, such as uh, prisons, in its own microcosm, right? And then we tend to focus on a lot of the smaller, important uh, elements that relates to changing the conditions within that framework. But in reality, I think what I heard this morning, which was very inspirational, is that we need to connect various elements. Uh, there are several uh, cross-cutting factors that connect different things, and one definitely is the angle of women or gender uh, into various topics. I think SDGs, um, for all that it's worth, is best um, uh, contributing to our collective thinking of how do we improve the world when we talk about partnership, when we look at the linkages between the issues. And yet, as we all know, in reality, we do go in our separate ways, looking at gender on its own, criminal justice on its own, uh, food security on its own. Uh, everything has different tracks of discussion. So I very much congratulate uh, TIJ and uh, UNODC's efforts to at least bring in various elements, uh, first in terms of goals, the goal five, and goal 16 together in this discussion. And the way you've organized this uh, three-day uh, interaction uh, have very much, I think, uh, highlighted on us uh, the need to look at things uh, in connectivity. Um, so a lot of what I was preparing to say uh, relating to the Bangkok rules, um, uh, which, uh, which of course echoes in SEDA, uh, um, our uh, uh, convention uh, against elimination of uh, uh, or convention, again, uh, to eliminate the discrimination against women, uh, echoes very much when it comes to various aspects, but especially in terms of treatment of female prisoners, um, that they are one of the most vulnerable groups, um, and that their specific needs and challenges need to be better reflected uh, in the administration of justice. So um, we, of course, start from that point. But I think the bigger point that I, I very much hope that we can come to discuss and, and also have follow-up conversations were the ones that were expressed this morning, which is that it's we really need to, and, and there's great work being done here in Thailand, for a great example to, to the region and the world, uh, to improve the condition of women in prison settings. I think we, we saw a lot of that. There's more we can do, of course, uh, that more needs to be done, but also that's only part of the puzzle. I, I think. Um, the big focus really should be to not get women into prisons. <laughs> and I think as we've been hearing over the past uh, two days, uh, also at the Chiang Mai uh, detention, uh, uh, um, a correction facility, um, a lot of women, 80% of the women that were there are on petite uh, Should they even be there? Uh, the, the fact that uh, if we look at the global scale, um, women represent a very small population of the prison population percentage-wise. So in different countries, uh, there are different statistics, but as we understand it, 
most countries would have it between 2 to 9 percent, so below 10 percent. Thailand is among one of the higher countries, I think with 15, 14, 15 percent. Um, but still, it is a smaller population compared to the vast majority of male prisoners. But the important thing is over the past 15 years, uh, this number was double, uh, doubled. So there was a 50 percent uh, increase in the past 15 years where although it's still a small percentage, have increased um, the women's population in the prison settings, but many of the systems of prison administration or even getting into prison is designed not at all taking into account the differentiation between men and women and how they come in contact with the law. Um, so I think we really should have um, a, a wider dialogue uh, around and this picks up on some of the things that were said this morning. How does a society look at crime? Uh, when do people become criminals in the legal sense? And would certain group of people, women be one, are they more affected um, in terms of having the, the tendency to become criminals when they really should be treated more as victims? Um, so this is a question I think we should start out with before we get into the prison setting. Women's contact to the law. Um, because majority of the women who are in prison settings globally, not all of them, but a vast majority of them are there because of a cumulative um, effect of discrimination, uh, disadvantages, poverty, uh, violence against women, uh, disrespect for women's um, basic conditions, which push them towards what would be seen as a criminal activity. Um, so, so you know, we will need the whole day to discuss if I go into details, but I think sitting in a, in a setting like Thailand, I think we can appreciate um, a lot of the things in the social norm uh, that we try to change um, has to go deeper than just looking at the, the manifestation of what happened, which is to already have uh, women in prisons, but how did they get there and how can we prevent that? So I think there were discussions also from the earlier panel um, about needing to focus on reintegration, but also prevention is very important. And I think uh, youth is, of course, another area, but definitely for women, there are uh, a big scope that we could see um, much more how can we prevent these people to get into prison in the first place. Um, so, so that's one point I wanted to bring. And then uh, another point I wanted to say is that uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of going to, uh, and let me look at the notes so, so I don't pronounce it wrong, uh, within Chiang Mai, uh, uh, um, Shang Kong district, uh, which is uh, sort of bordering uh, uh, Laos, um, not the Myanmar side, but the Laos side. And there I met, uh, of course, with the, the frontline officials and others, but also a group of women um, who are uh, uh, sort of training themselves, uh, capacitating themselves to be you know, in a small way, leaders in their own villages and, and settings. And it starts out with trying to watch out for women um, avoiding violence, uh, being uh, uh, violated. But also, they look at various other things that happens in the, in the village setting or in their community family settings, which really is crime prevention, right? It, which really is creating a healthier society where people's uh, uh, people are not pushed to becoming criminals. Uh, people know what to do to avoid uh, uh, the, being into the cycle of, of criminality. And a lot of that, as it's been said earlier too, um, has to do with avoiding poverty, uh, uh, removing or changing uh, certain social norms that allows disrespect for, for anybody really, but especially for certain group of people. Um, and a culture, I've been told a lot yesterday, that it's the culture of the North, that uh, women are, you know, commodities and they, they don't speak up, they're not supposed to, uh, the men in the household are supposed to be uh, taking decisions and they can do whatever they want. I hear this around the world in different places, but in every setting where I hear this, there are also women and men who are not like that as well. So how can we empower women and through them, their families, their communities, that creates a culture of respect, 
um, and also provide opportunity for their respect and, and, and goodwill to be able to lead into sustainable future for themselves, which is what SDGs is about. So I think if we can look, I, I, I think there's a lot we can do together in the area of improving correction systems um, and how women are treated in there. And I came with a long recommendation, but I, I'm not going into that so much uh, because it's been also articulated in the past few days. But I also think looking at the crowd of people and the interventions made this morning, I think we really should start a dialogue to see how can we influence the policies that segment these kind of assistance. Right? I heard uh, also earlier today a gentleman from the stock exchange. We, we do a lot, uh, as you have women with the stock exchange around the world, exactly for the kind of reason he has uh, highlighted, which is that so much of our effort to empower women um, cannot be done by public sector. And, and it has to be a part of the cycle of social development, which is driven by the economy, which is driven by business practices, uh, allocation of different funds to prioritize certain groups. Um, so we are teaming up uh, in view of the International Women's Day coming up in March with the Stock Exchange to have a big event um, to highlight to the group of CEOs and people uh, in the business sector to look at this, not just this corporate social responsibility, some charity they do to help women, but that it's in their business interest in the immediate sense, but also in creating a more stable, less fractured, uh, safe society where business and commerce can thrive. So as we have these discussions, and as I come here and hear about women's detention centers, and to hear comments coming like that from the floor and various interventions that came from other fellows as well that touches on how do we approach this differently. The use of social media and different ways to influence people's thinking um, has much less to do with these conference rooms where we adopt resolutions, um, and, and, but much more to do with people's click in their mind of what's acceptable, what's cool, what we want to strive to be. And I think this is where we need to team up much more um, beyond the government and the public sector ourselves with people in business, social influencers, uh, celebrities, others. Um, and I think this is where the, 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 the partnership that, that you're fostering uh, between TIJ and UNODC and bringing us all in um, is very, very inspiring uh, with, of course, the, 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 the auspices of, of Her Royal Highness, um, but also for the great number and mix of people who will walk out after these three days um, with a much better understanding of what needs to be done in uh, detention settings in criminal justice sector uh, in Thailand and in the region, but also beyond that to take that inspiration into some other wider social change. And if you're looking to do that, one angle that's, let's say, worth investing is the woman's angle, because that is so underutilized, under-recognized, and it will affect not only half the population, but their families. Um, so I hope uh, we will have continued discussions on this topic uh, to look at the improvement of criminal justice system, um, but also to look at the wider social conversation of social change. Um, so I think my time is up, so I will leave it at that. Uh, for the, the, the actual recommendations we have on improving prison settings, I'm not repeating here, but it's also in our website. It's also, I'm sure it'll come through the conference documents as well, but it does relate to the basic things that you have seen, uh, some of them well implemented at the Chiang Mai uh, facility. But unfortunately, that's not the reality for majority of prisons uh, in the region or around the world. So I'll leave it at that and uh, to, to very much look forward to practical discussions to come out to make a wider alliance of how can society tackle with reducing crime and what are the roles of women uh, in this context. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, well, that was excellent. I, I think uh, a couple of thoughts um, before I move on to Mr. Kalani. Um, you touched on the, the idea that we have to look at the wider social context and why are women ending up in prison. It's not simply a matter of managing prisons better, but there are, the fact that they get there for certain reasons is unfortunate. And, and it's good that we have the, the permanent secretary with us to reflect on 
the laws that are in place in the country and including the drug laws and how there so many are ending up. It was amazing the statistics we saw at the prison the other day. 80% of the ladies in Chiang Mai prison are there for drug offenses, many of which are relatively minor offenses. You refer to them as petty offenses, it's true. So how can we consider alternatives to imprisonment, even for criminal behavior? So because they have a, ending up in prison has a hugely disruptive impact on the family and on the communities that these ladies are coming from. Um, so anyways, I'm glad you raised that. Um, uh, and the other thing was, yesterday, you weren't with us, but we met some pretty powerful women. <laughs> Uh, yesterday from the community uh, in Doi Tung, some, a village head. Um, so it's not simply that women in the north are shy. I, we saw some yesterday that were definitely not shy and heard from them about the, the role that they had started to take in the community and, and transforming it. So, Which brings me to the next speaker, um, Mr. Kalani, who's going to talk about people-centered community reintegration. And Mr. Kalani, just so you're all aware, used to be in my role, he was the regional director for UNRC and then later the director of UNICRI, a representative of Columbia, and he's done work around the world on community uh, reintegration and especially in the, in the drug space. So he has a lot to offer in this discussion. So Mr. Kalani, maybe you can enlighten us on the work you're doing now in community reintegration with Joy Tung and how that uh, can contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, in particular to the organizers because uh, they give us a double opportunity. Yesterday you, you got already the opportunity to visit Oitung, and now I'm trying to summing up uh, how all of these uh, initiatives started 30 years ago. I'd like to remind you that uh, 30 years ago, Oitung was the capital of the opium market. At that time there was no Afghanistan. So 80% of, of drugs of the world, in particular heroin, was coming from there. Therefore the population was involved in opium production all of them, so they were all of them, according to the law, criminals. And not only criminals because they were producing opium, but also because they were trafficking people. Most of the families were uh, selling their child uh, to uh, commercial sex. Also, they were illegal immigrants, so they were coming from different countries, from Myanmar and China, and they were criminals. We did not establish any form uh, of correction. We did not establish any form of probation just because uh, the princess mother founded uh, the, the foundation, the Mayfa Wang uh, Foundation, had some fundamental principle. People are not bad. We just need to provide them a way to live and they will behave. Not only people are not stupid or they're not uh, uh, gender biased towards the women, they're also genius. All people is a genius. They can provide for the future. Then we, we need to reprogram the community perception and then, and then finally we have to open the mind of public and private sector. These are the principles of healing, not correcting the community, but just healing the community. Our concept of justice is that an incident happened between the person and the community. The state has no role because the state is just an administrator of justice. We, you just need to heal the community. We don't need to correct anybody. Uh, the area was uh, 29 villages, 11,000 population. You have seen what happened there. From that situation of extreme disruption, a community completely fractured and destroyed by arms. Yesterday you heard a arm, arm dealer, the lady who was stealing arms and weapons and bullets. She spent all her youth preparing bullets to kill people. That person, according to the law, should probably be in prison. She was not. She became a leader of the community and she provided a lot of the mindset change. Princess Mother, you see her here, nobody wants to be bad, but they do not have the opportunity to do good. This is our fundamental principle of rehabilitation and uh, uh, sustainable development-led uh, justice. So all the reasons for the poverty were identified, in fact here just a synthesis, but there are many more. Um, this is the only development project in the world that I know of. I have been in 135 countries, so I stand to be corrected, where no penny has been invent, uh, invested. 
nobody was given a penny or even one baht or ten baht. There was some investment by development banks, but it was just credit, so all the money was given back. Uh, all the transformation that you have seen yesterday was done by the people. Was it a change of education, public health, agriculture, economy? No. It was a change of mindset. People took their future in their hands and understood that community relation is fundamental. If you let somebody behind, if you let women behind, you let the community behind. If you let the children behind, you let the, the community behind. So only by connecting all this uh, issue, we could be uh, organized three-phase development, uh, which was in no way drug control. In that time, uh, in the 60s and the 70s, there was no drug control uh, organization of the United Nations at that time. So it was supported by the FAO to, to produce more development for forest. And we started with survival, and then we moved into sufficiency, which was mainly elimination of debt, and we are now in the phase of sustainability. So in, in terms of providing livelihood to, uh, to the people, we transformed them from opium farmers to forestry workers, and now landscape gardeners. I don't know whether some of you visited the garden yesterday. This garden produced 1.5 million euro per year, only by selling tickets. And then they became small entrepreneurs uh, involved in all kinds of our industry, which is food, tourism, uh, ceramic. And uh, we go up and up, uh, reprogramming the mindset of the, of the people, in particular investing on education. We have the highest level of Montessori school in Asia, one of the highest in the world. There are no other areas in the world with so many children in Montessori school. Not in Italy, not in Switzerland, where Mrs. Montessori was coming from. It is in the Golden Triangle, in Doitung. Children are aware of the future, of the, their community, of the diversity of the ethnic groups. They have a high respect for the monarchy. They have high respect, they really adore the princess mother and, uh, of course, Kim Bo uh, her son, and uh, the, the system of Thailand monarchy because they have been able to flourish. This was a system which gave thrivability to the people. In conclusion, opening the mind of public and private sector. We are in the Golden Triangle, we are in the corner of Thailand, we are small, but we participate in the global market. The people who served the coffee to you yesterday won the national prize for the best barista, not the one in Starbucks, not the one uh, in Sheraton or Hilton in Bangkok, if there were baristas from Doi Tung, because they understand what excellence is about. And we partnered then with the private sector uh, in order to continue our self-improvement. Another principle of the Princess Mother, people should never buy products out of charity, but they buy for their quality. Otherwise, they will only buy once. We have received a visit from the best uh, fashion industry in the world, the Caring Group, for example, and other uh, fashion, to study our production and establish partnership with us. Uh, the involvement in the future for the initiative of the Thai Institute of Justice, we are open and willing to receive uh, uh, people coming out of prison, even if their uh, sentence, their conviction is just suspended, we don't see people as criminals. We see people as equals. People who made a mistake, but the community also made a mistake, but, and the state also, by putting them in poverty. So if there is something to correct, what needs to be correct is mainly the community and the state. Uh, we are ready to cooperate in this initiative. You have seen how many opportunities. We have initiated projects in other parts of the country, so similar approach could be done. The only question is ask, we ask is what do the people get out of it? We are not interested in other kind of questions. Uh, we want to measure the outcome. How can we transform, transform the mindset and build a better future? You have seen people there who are very happy. None of our people will migrate to Chiang Rai or to Bangkok because they live better there. You see, we started from 
minus 75% on the per capita income compared with the capital of the country, in Bangkok, we are below 75%. So our people are making one-fourth of the money made by the people in the capital. Now we are 150% per capita income higher than Bangkok. Therefore, we attract people from Chiang Rai, Chiang Mai, uh, even we attract Falang, people who come to, to, to live there because of the high quality of life and the happiness. You can say that we have a kind of Davos, uh, Davos for Thailand, a place where people become happy. Uh, also, they are rich. Yes, they are rich. All of them, I told you yesterday, have a fridge, they have a TV, they have a motorbike, they have a uh, uh, pick up, they have a, a house with a roof, but all of this has been done by the community itself. Uh, our plan is sustainable, it's recognized by the United Nations as something that uh, is effective. The, the social entrepreneurship, uh, the Schwab Foundation and other uh, institutions around the world has recognized our social enterprise as sustainable. People are moving more and more into high school and also some of them into bachelor and the universities. Uh, and this has been the beginning of the project and this is the result after 30 years. Changing the future, making an alliance between people and forest, between people and people, also those who previously were considered bad people. But they were, first of all, they are people. Uh, the best way to reintegrate criminals is not to disintegrate the community. If you put people in prison for 25 years, you have disintegrated the family, you have disintegrated the community. This is not affordable for us. In Doitung, we will never do that. And therefore, uh, we have now a sustainable change based on a tribal community uh, that uh, leaves uh, the future because they put the future in their own hands. Thank you very much. something that, if there's lessons, maybe during the question period we can get to what can be taken from Doi Tung to help Ken Lung Jai and the rollout of the Bangkok rules, the lessons that might be applied to the prison system. Um, because there's also, we saw in some industry, if you will, inside the prison, but they're struggling to get, to find their feet. And so we need to think about how can we support that sustainability and, and the sustainability of Ken Lung Jai and their, their, their industry there. But I, I, we have to move on. Um, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Wissit, Witsar, Wissit Surat, uh, the Permanent Secretary of uh, Justice of Thailand. We're very honored that you flew up from Bangkok uh, today, sir. Um, and you're going to talk to us about the role of the criminal justice system here in Thailand uh, in the sustainable reintegration of offenders and the support that the MOJ is putting forward for the rollout of the Bangkok rules beyond the pilot that we saw in Chiang Mai. Uh, Mr. Permanent Secretary. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Jeremy, and good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you uh, for those two days um, that um, you visit the two uh, facilities, but um, I follow the, the, the progress closely due to the, the work at, uh, in Bangkok. Uh, normally, uh, when a government official represents the government in any panel, uh, we would be seen as a defendant coming to perhaps uh, tell you what we should do, uh, what we shouldn't do. But um, again, I think um, to start off, I would, I would love to answer the question that um, uh, we had at the plenary discussion. Uh, the question was how long we could perhaps move the Bangkok rules to the uh, more sustainable way. I think um, that would go to something along the line of policy making. Mm. We, 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 we may have people participation, we may have the knowledge, but until you get through the, the core of the, the movement that is to the government and the government supporting that, then you will get sustainability. Uh, we actually change our mind and also uh, look at the progress of the bank of rules. Uh, the TIJ has done a very, a very marvelous job. The, the policy on the Ministry of Justice is now in support of that. Uh, and that is also in, integrated into the policy and the KBI of the Corrections Department. 
which means that um, this year we, we targeted that the corrections department need to improve their Bangkok rule status and also the uh, prison facility to up to some certain level. So I think that we, we, we see that there is a benefit of, of dealing with that. With respect to the government, what, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Uh, we don't represent just one group of the people. We have to look at uh, all the pictures of, of the whole people. And um, uh, it's the same story, if you recall that you were young ones, right? Uh, you, were tell, you were told a story, and at the end of those story must be the very beautiful ending. Prince, the prince married the princess, and they live happily ever after. The same would apply to criminal process for those who get involved, which means that when, when, when you see the bad story of people committing a crime, they go to court, and at the end of the day, they were put into prison. And that's the end of it. We never, we, we never go through and try to find out whether they, whether they or not they're going to come up uh, in the society and be good again. The same applies to us when we got married. We know that after we got married, it's a long journey that we have to live together. And people are now laughing. Oh, yes, I, I realize that now. But it's a long journey and very challenging if you want a very successful marriage life. The same would apply to the rehabilitation. Um, and this is a mindset of the majority of the people in the country. So I think the, um, that would apply also to, to most of the staff that we have. The, the fact that they put into prison, that is not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of how to put them back into the society. And with the, with the concept of what we have, I think the, something that I see and we try to change that mindset in the policy level is that people have uh, a look at the work in like a silo. Uh, the judge say you go to prison, right? If you go to prison, it's going to be your, the, the prison officer who deal with them. And of course, after you deal with them, they are out of society. Well, no one look after them. So we, I think the, with, the, with the concept of reintegration, we have to change the mindset of all the people getting involved. We look at the, the new policy, the new policy was issued by the Minister of Justice and it's starting off with, with the juvenile justice first because it's smaller, so we're starting with that. The, the key thing is that we agree uh, with previous speakers that nobody is bad, um, but they lack opportunity. So if you want to make them uh, have a better life, like have a good life model approach, that might be better than putting them into some kind of um, torture and make sure that they will, will not come back to commit a crime because they are afraid of prison. That never, ne ne that never work. We look at the statistics. We have like five, 600 people put in jail every day. Five that came out every day. So, and all together of the number of the prisoners, we have around, around 320,000 in prison now. So, <clears throat> Uh, part of Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai might be just a, a minimal part of the world. And those 320,000 people, how many of them recommitted a crime? We did not have that figure in the, in the maybe like two years ago. But we now starting to have those kind of statistics. And it became clear that 27% um, 20 of those would come back to prison within three years. So now we get a goal, because unless you can measure that, you cannot change it. So this is something that we are trying to look at the way to improve the, well, to reduce the recidivism. Now, in order to make sure that they would go out having a better life, it is not a one, one model that fits everybody. It's no one size fits all, and in fact, we know, because in the criminal justice, we were taught that people must be dealt with individually. We're going to have individual plan for them so that we know exactly what is the, the problem that they have. Well, <clears throat> with the number of those people and the capacity of the staff and the corrections, I tell you that there is no chance. Because if we start using the same model and we don't have new technology to deal with that, by the time you have a plan for one individual prisoner, you get what? How many people coming in after that? So, but I tell you that that is a hope. Because 
at this stage, we're starting a program on the big data analysis. Uh, we understand that we can calculate the risk by, by way of when you go to borrow the money from the bank, they have a credit scoring, right? And that kind of things now put into the system. We study of it during our justice, they have the, the model. So we, we tend to have some kind of finding the, the, the problems and finding the correlated factors that they will come back. The big data project is now starting, so we hope that <clears throat> together with what we have, it might be a better idea when we have a better picture to analyze and perhaps heal, like we heard from other speakers, we perhaps heal them. Of course, we don't have to wait for that because we know that some certain issues are now uh, obvious. We know that uh, poverty is one one problem, we want them to be uh, a better off after they, they've gone out. So what we try to do is that instead of having the person have set in the plan and then release them, that is the plan must be connected between the life inside and the life outside. Without that, you never do that. And of course, the if we, if we, even if we talk about the occupation, we want to have a vocational training, right? We have to change most of them because the, 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 what we have at present in other prisons, not like the Doi Tung and the, 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 the Chiang Mai that you visit, might be something that go beyond time. We, we give them something that they don't want, right? We maybe just to kill the time. So in order to make sure that the vocational training is suitable for them to go out and, and do the job, something must be changed within the vocational training inside some profession, something that we, we, we learn about in the, 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 the coffee shop, the barista, the barista thing. There, there could be a change of a lot of things inside. Together this, you need to have a connected factor with the, with the people outside. Because otherwise, you train them, they, they cannot go out. So that is what we are trying to do. Another issue which um, <clears throat> we, we talk about the, the training is that Maybe that is not it. The lacking of everything, maybe they lack education, maybe they lack skill on the work, maybe they even have other problems like mental health. We try to change the mindset of the people here. What is the obstacle mindset that we have? Is, is it always like, um, well, you are dealing, you are giving, well, the prisoners better than the people outside. So this is a key thing when you have to convince the people outside that, well, I think you are in the wrong perception. Just think of yourself. If you are okay, if your health is fine, we don't have to spend a lot of money on you. But if you are ill, right, if we spend a lot of money on you, if you are even sick, put in the, in the hospital and in the ICU, we definitely put a lot of money on you because your problem is something that we have to heal. This is a key thing. When you talk about the education, I, I, I dealt with the juvenile. It seems like if you don't give a better education for them in the juvenile facility, you never get them out because they are someone who actually fallen beyond, beyond the safety net. And if you give them the same thing that you give them outside, that will not change them. So I think this is the, the problem we have to change the mindset even for the educational ministry that something we should give them even something better maybe we have a better training we have a better model for them to study the same would apply to the skill maybe we think of if we teach them how to do that they would be able to work I tell you it's not it's not it because many of them may need some other assistance we understand that well for us when we know how to do it, we may actually do it in our real life. But the problem is, for many prisoners, we need to actually help them, even make them, what do they call it, confident in order to work, give them some support for them after they release, there are some funding that we need to help them, make sure that there are someone visiting them, make sure that they are being able to go back into their life. So, this is what we are trying to do at, at the moment with the Ministry of Justice. We are changing the mindset of the ministry. We are putting those KBI 
work of the of the staff with the juvenile justice and the, and the corrections department. We hoping that once this policy is now formed, we send them the KPI and make sure that we are start changing the mindset of the people within the Ministry of Justice. We hope that once we got through this, right, we might do some part. And of course, the part that we do is only the starting point. We need to make sure that when they go out, those who are going to assist them would work with us from the beginning. So this is maybe, um, you may call it as a defense, but I call it as a vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Member Secretary. I like what you said at the beginning about the different audience. I know you Thank you, Mr. Member Secretary. I like what you said at the beginning about the different audience. I know you, in your role, you have to deal with different audiences, the public, who have one view of crime, and then you have to also, you're dealing with the prisoners and looking after them and their better interests and, and to reintegrate them to society. So maybe when we get to the questions at the end, we can talk about the policies in place in the government that, and how the public might perceive policy change, because it's very important you have to bring them alongside with potential change in drug policy, which I know the government is debating, how will we change drug policy, which may have an effect on lowering prison population, but also alternatives to imprisonment. Is the public open to other things, other, like for example, community service, or are they open to parole and probation, to what extent, so forth. I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Um, anyway, the next speaker, moving along, is, is a very good old friend of uh, ours uh, in the UN system, uh, Dr. Apanen Ramatana of Chiang Mai University. He's uh, going to speak to us about Doi Rang, um, but he's also a very uh, well-known expert in the region on treatment, drug treatment, and community-based drug treatment. Um, so I'll turn it over to you now, uh, Dr. Apinun, and maybe you can enlighten us about Doi Rang and, and uh, the prisoner pre-release programs that are, that are there. Thank you very much. And Jeremy, uh, thank you for having me sharing our experience here. Uh, as a, actually a physician, family physician, I don't know, how I reach this point sitting here around discuss about prisoners' uh, issues. Uh, <clears throat> I get opportunity to uh, engage in one of a uh, sort of pilot try of how uh, we can apply people-centered, sustainable reintegration of offenders uh, uh, here at uh, Chiang Rai province. Uh, how we can get criminal justice system and the community work together. Uh, one of the reasons may be because uh, I have uh, working with some community here on various issues around drug problems solving. So uh, I would like to share our initial uh, lesson learned uh, from a uh, pre-release program here at a prison we call Doi Ran uh, Prison, which is a special prison uh, that is the one who separate from the main Chiang Rai prison and has a special uh, arrangement uh, aiming at uh, applying effective pre-release program. The objective uh, is trying to improve uh, on uh, authentic development concept aiming at effective reintegration and hopefully reduce recidivism uh, among this uh, prison population. Here is the front of the prison, the Dairan prison, uh, we call open prison. That means uh, people can walk in and out. There's no fence, no high rise uh, fence. More than that, that's the back of the open prison. It's a nice view of Gok River. Uh, prisoner can get down there swimming away and so on. So that's a challenging uh, when we put prisoners in this uh, kind of uh, prison. So we call it the open prison. 
to begin the work, actually, uh, DOIRA program uh, has been implemented for uh, seven years uh, when we start to engage in uh, how to conclude and how to improve this uh, program. Uh, we learned that uh, we, we explore uh, the prisoners, the current system, uh, the staff, and see uh, what we dealing with. At the beginning, we learned that majority were able to start up again with support from families and governmental agencies, as uh, we learned from the uh, previous. Uh, speaker that uh, about 20 percent you, you you said 77 percent uh, re offend into the prison again so that means majority actually they can find their way out uh, however for the difficult one poor self-efficacy uh, they mentioned that when we interviewed them when they get released from the prison, they dare not go out from their home for at least one week because they don't know how to speak to the others. They don't know how to speak to the community leaders and so on. So uh, that, that's one finding that we think we should find a way to improve their self-efficacy before release. And we, we found that the first thing when they get out of jail is getting smartphone and open up social media and connect to the world through that. Not go out from their home and discuss with the people, with the community, but they have their own community. And you, you would imagine who they would connect it first would be the, the similar people before they get in jail on the social media. So, so that, that, that's what we learned. And yes, heavy alcohol use, actually, uh, within probably a few months, uh, or probably 95 of them, uh, heavy alcohol use, and, and get together sometime when, when they have time, they, they drink together. And some person, uh, when they relapse through drug use and get uh, arrested again, we learned that uh, the influence or the, the factor probably involve their partners. If they have pa partners who drinking alcohol and use drugs, they tend to relapse through drug use and get arrested again, especially when their family uh, also have drug use uh, habit. So that, that's what we learned about uh, previously uh, program and how we can improve this. The curriculum actually uh, previously designed uh, for nine months, but after that, after a few uh, uh, try, reduced to five months, the curriculum aimed at uh, uh, pre-release prisoners as students experts on therapeutic community and behavioral counseling uh, to help improve self-efficacy and better prepare them for uh, for going out with really. this. Uh, under the concept of uh, alternative development, uh, we try to improve the curriculum uh, to improve themselves as intention to do good and has performed well uh, all along and then has less than uh, one year of uh, prison sentence. So uh, the capacity for each uh, try would be about 50 person, 50, uh, 50 prisoners. Uh, so in, in this open prison, they live together and uh, form up as a team and form into three teams aiming at uh, learning how to work as a team. Uh, obviously, uh, ag agricultural and vocational choice uh, open up for them to practice according to their preference. Uh, some may do agriculture, some may want to do uh, the others. Uh, so whatever 
that prison, uh, Dairang prison can provide in that uh, beautiful area, they, they, have it, they can engage in that. Uh, yes, as a broader information about Thai society for them to learn and realize how they have to adjust to Thai society uh, in the large, uh, provide some volunteer labor support. Obviously, when they are prisoners, you can't say that they volunteer because when you say uh, we have to go out and help some village on these issues, uh, they have to go out. But uh, through those activities, uh, I think they learn along how to provide uh, volunteer support to the communities and gain uh, respect from communities. Uh, we, we provide some training in the prison on uh, self-efficacy enhancement. We provide training on family relation enhancement and we provide medical care. So uh, we have three houses here. They split up into three groups and stay together and they have to select uh, their leaders and uh, rules to stay together and work together. Uh, and you can see that in the area they can grow vegetable uh, plants and others that uh, for agricultural uh, income. Uh, in the training, uh, it's uh, trying to be a skill build up training for them. Uh, they have a group process, they learn together, they learn along, and they uh, improve their self efficacy through those practice. We also plan uh, to train prison staff on therapeutic community principles and practice uh, because we learned that uh, through these practices, uh, Prison staff then understand how to assist these prisoners uh, and improve their self-efficacy enhancement. Uh, and we adjust the contents of this curriculum uh, to fit all together in a, a good serial manner. The lesson learned uh, we get great support and participation uh, of local experts, especially counselor team. Uh, some sit within you, the participation. Uh, great support from prison and probation staff. Great participation of pre-release prisoners. They are very happy during the five-month curriculum and they learn along. And obviously we get strong support from the INSPIRE project or Kamlang Chai project. And uh, this is one of the uh, agricultural land uh, of the one of the prisoners passed through this pre-release program and get released, and they they utilize their uh, knowledge and organize their agricultural land all along. And you can see that uh, the princess visited the the, the land and. Uh, learn along how they utilize the uh, things they learn. This is one of the, another one who opened up a uh, uh, noodle sh uh, shop. Uh, yeah, and it is in Chiang Rai at Mechan area, so you can try. The challenge would be medical problem, uh, the common is tuberculosis. And uh, the plan to train the limited number of staff and, and heavy workload uh, prohibit us to proceed with the training program. So we hope that we can adjust something and in next period we can try it again. And uh, many prisoners not released after the program. So. Uh, we we think if we shorten the the program so that after we finish the release program pre-release program uh, training they can 
and get into the community right away, that would be better. For reintegration, uh, we try to think about the big issues of social stigma that uh, this person gets. So we uh, plan reintegration system development by involve uh, uh, community leaders. Uh, hopefully they can come as a moderator and uh, teach our prisoners how to, uh, how to engage in to the society positively. So we want to promote community attitude to after release prisoners as well and to test out whether we can have active community participation on the community based social and vocational training. Uh, so we we our challenge would be the the large geographical difficult uh, distribution of the prisoners' homes at uh, general public and we have no existing program and no peer uh, support group uh, to start with. So we look at one strong community base, uh, a community uh, who have strong community base, multi-sectoral relationship already in Chiang Rai area. They have positive attitudes toward people centered program and agree to active participate as a training site. So we, we have two meetings at the county admin office. We organize three exposure visits to the prison and we have two meetings to plan on community-based training. It is ongoing piloting uh, program, haven't finished yet. But uh, we learned that after we have done through this, we have great community leader team attitude. Uh, after they have exposure visits. So, uh, they, we also have existing local networking facilitating engagement of local resource uh, through the program. So hopefully, uh, all this, then uh, we can put together the reintegration program effectively, having uh, staff training properly, having complete participation, and having some role recreation uh, for for the release uh, program better, and uh, we will follow to see whether we will get the outcome that we expected. So I would like to thank all these for the part of work. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Appen, and that's uh, for the detailed presentation. Um, it's interesting how you brought in a community which dealt with uh, changing perceptions, really, in a way. Um, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. And it makes me think of the permanent secretary who's beside you here. Um, first of all, I hope nobody swam away from the prison. <laughs> you don't want to say that in front of him, though, because <laughs> then he might have to do something about it. But I am curious about changing perception on a broader scale. And this is where I'm thinking about the permanent secretary. Because if you are to effect a policy change, um, uh, you need public support for that change. And so we've been talking about uh, the past couple of days about uh, drug policy. We've been talking about alternatives to imprisonment or looking at release and reintegration. But you need the public on side with some of these efforts. And I'm wondering what the government is doing about bringing the public on side to a change, so that so that it'll be well received, and maybe you can enlighten us in that in that regard. Hello. Okay. Uh, changing the perception is a very difficult thing. Um, basically, uh, once you believe in something, you never change. And in order to change that, um, it is not like you giving them another opinion and they're gonna change it. So what we try very much is instead of giving the public something along the line of this is a new concept and they should like it, they wouldn't like it. Uh, we heard many people in the intervene that um, some would even encourage more for more punishment. Uh, and that is because they believe in that punishment is good and, and I, I wouldn't say that they are wrong. So what we're trying to do is that um, uh, we're trying to give the public more and more 
evidence-based uh, information. Um, we understand that when people look at people who actually released from prison, I think most of the public will say that they're going to go back to prison, most of them. But you can see that the, the statistics show that 20%, 27% uh, seems to be not that very good, but we try to reduce that. But it actually shows something. So if you want to change the public, um, you need to give them more information and, and, and more accurate uh, data. So we're trying that. And secondly, of course, the public is one, one problem. Another problem is that the staff themselves, because they fall all the, the tiny part of the public. We, we engage um, to the perception of, of stigmatize uh, those who went into prison and how to change it. We know that they are part of the disqualification in everything that if you go to prison, you cannot come back to work, right? And one, one simple example, which is very, very odd. I was sitting in, in, a, in a meeting uh, run by the probation office, and there is, oh, it's a 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> and they, 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 they pointed out something along this line. They said, this is a qualification for probation volunteer. Right? And new rules. And one of those is that if you want to become a probation volunteer, you can never go to prison. They put that. So I ask them, if you don't trust them, those who went through your system, how could anybody trust them? So they went back and delete those. So this is a kind of not only changing the public. Even the, the, the officers, you still need to change the, the concept. And uh, one point which is very good that is to reduce the stigma onto those who went into prison. We are now uh, trying to gather and drafting a new law. Um, not like you, 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 you have to get a balance anyway, otherwise we won't, we won't get the law through. But there is a key way where we would allow a um, certain number of people who went into prison to go back to work even with the government. That's it. That's really interesting. Maybe Sandra, just building on that. Um, Doi Tung effectively changed perception over years, but they've had a long-term view. Obviously, I think several decades, and still are working. Um, and, but it's proven sustainable. So maybe I don't know if you could talk about how they changed that perception because they were working in arguably incredibly difficult conditions on a difficult issue on drug issues, but they took it from a different perspective and they brought the community along. And I don't know if there's lessons from that that can be applied outside Doi So maybe you could enlighten us on that. Um, I see yesterday our leaders have recognized answering the question, the same question that Jeremy is doing, is asking now. The community was highly fractured. It was fragmented. It was sick. Uh, Six in every regard, as the doctor said, there was not only sick in the heart, there were sick in, in the body, uh, they were sick uh, because they were opium addicted. So they recognized that to rebuild solidity of the community, to make it stronger, they need solidarity. Solidarity is the only way to make the solid stronger. So they, they had to reduce this fracturing. And they accepted that it would take time. So instead of giving 20 years in prison to somebody, because somebody did something very wrong in that community, like for example the leader who was leading all the uh, trade of opium, the one who is now the head of the coffee program, no? uh, he understood that it will take time. It will take time, it will, mean that it will mean that it will invest in the next generation. So the, the, new, the, the children will have to invest in we're going to the movies, so maybe. <laughs> uh, they, they have to invest into the next generation. Therefore, uh, for them, time was important because it was their life. So everybody has been as committed to a kind of, uh, let's call it, uh, life sentence that they will uh, commit the whole community to facilitate this healing. And this question that uh, Jeremy asked is the most difficult to make other communities, other people to understand. When I went to Colombia, another very dramatic conflict, the longest conflict on earth, 
60 years the country was in conflict in war for 60 years with a lot of terrorists all over the country. There are many provinces where nobody from the state could enter, no police, no army, because it was under the control of the drug dealers and the narco-traffickers and the organized crime. So when we tell them it will take you at least 20 years, most probably 30 years, a lot of people in the parliament, in the press, say, hey, hey, wait a moment, these are our drug dealers, these are criminals. They've killed people, they've killed children, they killed, uh, even uh, they have attacked uh, with bombs at the school. What do you want to deal with these people? That's okay, let us continue the war for another 60 years. So the, our approach is very, very practical. You have to understand that you have to give up a certain quantity of so-called justice, which is not justice, is a retribution. You have to give up a certain quantity of punitive approach in order to get peace. And so this is what restorative justice is about. Very few countries in the world have succeeded to put up a program of restorative justice. A lot of people focus on offenders instead of focusing on the victims. And the victims is the community. So if the community understand that they have to go through a 20 years restorative justice program. That means that the correction is not the correction of the offender only, it's also the correction of the community. Because the community did something wrong, allowing those dramatic level of poverty and abuse, including the abuse of the forest that make it impossible for the next generation to continue. This is a complete uh, rebuilding of how the community is organized. And I've been around in the world in many places, I told you. Normally the poor people or people who have the stigma of having done something wrong are afraid of the power. Yesterday I told you, we were afraid at the beginning of the princess mother because she was the mother of the king, very powerful lady. She was arriving with the army with the helicopter, Mayfar Wang means uh, coming from the sky. And we were afraid they were kicking out uh, of our land uh, that they were putting us into prison. As soon as we understood that they were there to be with us, trust was rebuilt. So the key word here is trust. It's not about rehabilitation people, but about rehabilitating trust between government, people, and community. So if you rebuild the trust, then anything becomes possible. And in Colombia, we have now leaders who have given the AK-47, Kalashnikov, the police did the ballistic, and we know that that Kalashnikov belongs to a person who has killed 150 people. How many life sentences you want to give to that guy? You don't want to have him free in the community? Okay, then we continue the war for another 60 years. Are you willing to change the framework? Are you willing to change the, 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 the attitude and the mindset about crime. Only those communities who change the framework uh, will be able to make something truly sustainable. Otherwise, we will do a pilot, another bonsai. The bonsai are very nice, keep it very tall. But we need a forest. We need the forest of common good and change of responsibility among communities and governance, uh, including uh, all those who have been affected by very bad incident like crime. Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate that. It makes me think of uh, half of the community. What role do women, what unique role could they play um, in changing social norms in the community that might help restore and provide for sustainable change? No, I, I'm glad we're coming to this topic because um, it goes beyond today's immediate discussion. But I think one part where UN Women is really focusing on is women's role to transform societies, right? And especially in cases like perception. Uh, how do you look at what's good and bad? Uh, how do you look at people who are criminals? How do you deal with people you don't agree with? Uh, to the kind of powerful example that uh, Samra was giving. So we're focusing women's role in various parts, but also in value shaping, um, of course in the family context, but also in, in the communities they represent. We are doing very interesting projects assisting um, some countries of Asia Pacific, uh, uh, 
looking at the connection between women and their ability to prevent violent extremism. Because a lot of that is very much indeed a focus on a punitive or law enforcement based approach, a judicial, a legal approach. But at the end of the day, when we do studies of actual foot soldiers of violent extremism and, or, or destabilizing acts uh, involving violence, very often these people are brought up in families uh, where there was violence was the norm. Uh, there was no understanding of how to deal with differences other than expressed through violence. Very often, a lot of criminals, men and women, um, are, sub, uh, are products of, of a life that they've been victimized. But of course, they're seen as criminals. Um, and then the society public is afraid of them. Um, so in order to change that kind of value system, um, mothers, wives, uh, uh, daughters, colleagues uh, in communities play a big role. Um, of course, as young women, we don't want to reduce the role and significance of women to just role of a mother, but it is a big factor. And so, especially I think in Asian contexts where, where family values are very important, um, we're really focusing on this. And uh, the experience that, that we have in working with some uh, former extremist group families uh, in Indonesia and in Bangladesh and soon in the Philippines as well, really come up with hard evidences of how women play and can play a very positive role in this. But it's also important to recognize that that is also a way to empower women too. So in a sense, you hit two birds with one stone, that you have a more tolerant, uh, accepting, uh, peaceful society that can give second chance to people who might have been prisoners, um, but also to prevent these people from coming into prisons in the first place. Um, so to look at that opportunity to use women's agency for the, 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 the betterment of the, the social uh, understanding of how we deal with these issues, but at the same time providing leadership and recognition to women uh, who get to be that leader in, in community family context. So I think this is a part that I, I, I very much hope that features into your discussions um, when we look at how do you look at the social norm change we want to affect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mima. Um, I've been kindly reminded, by the way, we do have others in the room. And uh, so I'd like to throw it open to the floor um, for the next 15 minutes if there's questions to the Senate panel. Um, now's the time.